So in Luke chapter 14, just to get the context of what we're reading here, when you, when you look back here in, the, in verse number one, the Bible says, And it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day that they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man. So the context of Luke 14, at least the first half of Luke 14, because it changes later down when you get down to verse number 25, it says, and there went great multitudes with him. And he turns, you know, so he's kind of leaving this thing. But the first part of, of chapter 14, he goes into this house of one of the chief Pharisees. So he's surrounded by Pharisees, the chief Pharisees, and the people who they would invite along with Jesus Christ into their house. And he notices in the beginning part, I'm not going to be preaching on this part, but just to you know, bring you up the speed to the part where, I, where I'm going to start um, getting into the, the real meat of the sermon. He sees the way that they, the Pharisees take their rooms and, and their places and their, you know, their, their positions at the feast. Right? However big of a banquet this is, how many people are coming. He notices how people are going to like the best spot. Like, oh man, I want to get the best place. And he's pointing out their attitude, just saying, you know what? When you go to a place like that, don't go and seek out the best place for yourself. Because if someone else comes who's better than you, that's more esteemed than you, that has more prestige or whatever, then they're going to come to you and say, uh, sorry, buddy, this place is reserved for him. You know, and then you're going to be shamed because you're just, just going to be publicly shown like, yeah, this guy's better than you. So like go somewhere else. He says, what you ought to do is just take the, the least seat, you know, the, the, the worst seat in the house. And then when they come, you know, when whoever's feast that is comes, you say, oh, no, no, no. Hey, I've got a much better place for you. That's honorable, right? So this was part of the attitude that he's just explaining to them and just demonstrating their own hypocrisy to them and, try, you know, and trying to get them to see this. Now, then he, he goes into this concept of a dinner or supper being called, and he says, look, don't call your friends and you know, the people that basically can pay you back where you're all just returning the favor, he's saying, you know, when you make a feast, you know, you're blessed if you invite the lame and the poor and people who they have no means of paying you back and you're just doing nice for some of them, you're making a meal, hey, come on in. That's generous, that's loving, that's, you know, actually doing something other than just, just gathering with each group and just, you know, paying each other back. And after that statement, verse 15, it says, And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, so he hears what Jesus is saying, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus doesn't rebuke him for saying that because it's not a rebukable statement in my opinion. Because it is. It's blessed, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. That is a blessed thing. He's going to eat bread in the kingdom of God. But Jesus explained, you know, because he's, he's pointing out their hypocrisies. And he goes into now this, this story here. He says, he, he tells this parable, starting in verse 16. He says, then said he unto him, so he's responding to him, to, his, to this comment. And yeah, it is great for people to go to heaven. Yeah, it is blessed for someone to eat bread in the kingdom of heaven. But he, what Jesus starts to explain to him is that, yeah, you and your Pharisees, you know, your own, you, you, you know, he came unto his own, his own received him not. And he's, he's going to start explaining how the Jews or the nation of Israel, by and large, has rejected the salvation that has come unto them. And he does it by way of this parable. So he's saying here, well, a certain man made a great supper and bad many. He called many people. Well, he is having this great supper, this great feast, and he called a lot of people to come to his supper. Verse 17, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come for all things are now ready. Again, illustrating Jesus Christ himself said, hey, it's time. Come, I'm here. You know, come meet with me. Come, come eat with me. And then what happens? It says, and they all with one consent began to make excuse. The people he invited are all starting to come up with excuses saying why they can't be yours. As the first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. So here's someone that just apparently buys a piece of land, sight unseen, and just saying, oh, well, I just bought this and I need to go check it out, right? 
thanks for inviting me to dinner, but you know, I, I, I've got to take care of this business. Lame excuse. And then he said, another, verse 19, another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray that you have me excuse. And look at these stupid, you, know, you just bought it now and then you're going to prove it. Like you just bought this land and you have to go see it. Why aren't you going to check it out before you buy it? Why aren't you proving the oxen before you say, no, I'm, I'm going to prove them first and then I'm going to buy it. You know, you could tell these are, because no one does that. It's excuses. They're coming up with any reason not to go to the supper because really they don't want to go because they think it's a waste of time or whatever it is. And they're just coming up with any reason to tell them why they don't want to go to the supper. It says here, verse 20, another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Well, can you bring your wife too? I probably wouldn't reject you. Verse 21, so that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house being angry said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. That's Jesus' response to the guy that says, you know, blessed is he that eateth bread in the kingdom of God thinking that they're all blessed because they're all going to heaven. And he's saying, you know what? Many are bidden to come to that feast. And many people are given excuses as to why they can't come. And, and obviously symbolically rejecting their invitation to the supper and their invitation to salvation. And I think this is talking about the Jews rejecting Jesus. You know, that is the primary uh, application of this parable. Amen. But I'm going to go beyond that tonight because I think it's still supportive scripture for what I'm preaching on. And the subject I'm preaching on tonight and the title of my sermon is God hates excuses. Because you can look at this and what is he saying in this parable? G you know, there is someone being, there are people being called. There are people being bidden. Hey, come unto me. Come to my house. I have this supper for you. And what do they do? They just come up with any lame excuse to not go out and, and, and come and join God and join Jesus. And I'm going to use this, this, this passage, and not just this passage alone, believe me. We're going to be looking at plenty others. But we see the anger that is in the, the, you know, this, the, the master of the house here who is representing God from all these excuses. From him taking apart the time to set apart and say, man, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm getting this feast ready. I'm preparing the house, the table, the chairs, everything, the food. It's all ready to go and I want you to come. And everyone's just completely disrespectfully, nope, can't do it, can't come. And I'm going to be applying this to not just salvation because look, when it comes to salvation, as Romans 1 says, it says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Everyone in this world today is without excuse when it comes to being saved. When it comes to recognizing that God is real. So the atheist is without excuse. They have no excuse to say that there is no God. God's evidence is there. It's clear. From the, from the creation of the world, his eternal power and Godhead is there and is visible and is easily understood and seen by his creation so that we are without excuse. But not just that. When God has called us to do a work, when God has called us to do something and we're bidden of God, to go and do something, you know what God hates to hear? God hates to hear all the reasons in the world why, no, God, I can't do that today. No, God, I can't come to church because I've got some other thing, you know, whatever other stupid thing going on. I've got to go exercise or I've got to do, you know, the football games on. I can't go soul winning, God, because I stubbed my toe. Lame excuses. And God hates excuses. God, you know, Look, when there's a val did any of these people have a legitimate reason not to come to So did someone say like, I'm in a hospital right now because my legs got cut off and I can't leave because <laughs> I'm bleeding or what, you know, whatever. That isn't what he was getting angry about. It wasn't someone saying, I'm vomiting, I can't leave the house. 
you know, I'm deathly ill or whatever. That was not something that, because that was a, maybe a legitimate reason not to show up and say and they'd have understanding. Everything that we saw here was an excuse. It was a lame excuse, not something that by any means you could say, oh yeah, that's valid. It's just stupid things that you want to use to, to put off whatever it is that God's calling you to do. Now, it's our nature. To, keep a finger here. We're going to come back to Luke 14. We're going to hit the, the second part of that passage in a little bit. Put a bookmarker there or something. But turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter 3. It's in our nature to make excuses for ourselves, especially when it comes to sin. Because there's a lot of things that we could be making excuses about. I just started to touch on the things what God wants you to do, he's calling you to do. But there's a lot of things that God tells us not to do. Right? And we've got plenty of commandments in the Bible where God says, you know, thus saith the Lord, you know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. You know, and you go through the whole list of commandments of things that we should not be doing. And you know what God does not want to hear when you break one of his commandments? Some lame excuse as to why you did what you did. Oh, well, you don't understand. You, don't, you see, the reason why I commit adultery is because my wife isn't giving me any attention at home. My wife doesn't love me anymore. So, the, see, when you understand, God doesn't want to hear your stupid excuses. He said, don't commit adultery. Don't even look on another woman to lust after her. So what in the world are you thinking when you commit adultery? You can't justify yourself and make up some excuse as to why you're doing what you're doing. Now, as I said, it's human nature. It goes back to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And look what Adam says. And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. So what's he start to do right away? Point the finger. Now, he admitted he ate, right? But he said, Yeah, but see, you don't understand. See, the, the woman who you, you gave to me, God, this, this woman, you, you gave her to me, God, she gave me the fruit. It's not me. I didn't go and pick it off the tree and eat it myself. See, she gave it to me and I did eat. Right away, starting to, to, to put the blame. Look, sorry, Adam. You know who's responsible for you eating the fruit? You are. It's not God's fault for creating the woman to be a help for you. It's your fault for disobeying God. But he's not the only one that does that. Verse number 13 says, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. So, right, so we start going down the line. Adam, how do you know you're naked? Did you eat the fruit? Well, yeah, I did, but see, it's her fault. And then it was, okay, Eve, what did you do? Well, yeah, see, I, I ate, but it's the serpent's fault. And at the end of the day, everyone's going to want to blame the devil. The devil made me do it, right? Why did you steal? I don't know. Satan just got to me. Why did you commit adultery? Oh, Satan just got to me. Look, yeah, there has to come a point where you're going to say, I am responsible for my own actions. And you're not going to go to God and just say, the devil made me do it. God doesn't want to hear your excuses. And in this story, did God accept their excuses at all? Nope. Not even one little bit. All three of them got punished because they all sinned. The serpent got punished because the serpent was beguiling and deceiving and lying about God's word and, and deceiving Eve into taking the fruit. Eve was punished because she disobeyed the commandment of God, straightforward commandment. She allowed herself to be deceived instead of just trusting in the Lord and trusting in his word and not doing it, no matter what anybody said. She transgressed, and then Adam, same thing. They're all held responsible for their own actions. And you know what God does not want to hear? He doesn't want to hear your excuses, your justifications for your sin, because there is no justification for sin. We need to be able to acknowledge our sin and take responsibility when we do wrong. And this is actually how we will receive mercy from God. 
God hates the stiff neck attitude that refuses to acknowledge their sin. If you really want to make God angry, and that's why I said, you know, the, the title of the sermon is God hates excuses. Don't let that slip by you. That word hate is very important in this sermon. You need to understand how, how, how much God has displeasure, extreme hatred, displeasure for this type of an attitude, for, for an excuse making attitude where nothing is ever your fault but somehow you just constantly find yourself in sin. You can look at the whole history of the children of Israel wandering around in the wilderness as a good example of how much God hates a stiff-necked attitude and all the judgments and punishments that came their way because they refused to just humble themselves and hearken unto the Lord and trust in Him. Instead of just, just complaining, murmuring, nothing's ever good enough. We can't beat these people. God's lying. Oh, he just brought us out here to kill us and all this other nonsense that they were spewing instead of just having faith in God's word and then wanting to push the blame off on someone else. Proverbs 28, 13 says, turn if you would to Exodus chapter four. Proverbs 28, 13 says, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And that's in your heart. When you have a heart that just immediately wants to jump to an excuse as to why you didn't do something or why you did something wrong, you are not going to find mercy from God. You want to find mercy from God, you're going to say, I am sorry, God. I screwed up. I take responsibility for it, Lord. Please have mercy. Right. And you want to see someone who has a good example of this type of heart was King David. When King David is confronted about his sin, did he make up excuses? Did he make up an excuse? As to, did he even say, well, Bathsheba, she was, she, I mean, she was bathing and I could see her. She shouldn't have been bathing where I could see her. It's all her fault. See, if she wasn't doing that, then I would go, no. He said, I'm sorry, Lord. Now, it had to be pointed out to him, but once it was pointed out to him, once he was confronted about it, he was sorry. He did repent, and, and, and there was multiple times where David has done wrong, like when he numbered the children of Israel, and he confesses, sorry, Lord, I sinned. And he's, you know, he goes on further to say, you know, don't take it out on these sheep, Lord. They didn't do anything. You know, to put it on me and on my house. I'm the one who did it. And he is looking to take that responsibility. And you know what? He chose the right, when he had these choices of, of, of the three punishments, he chose wisely. Because God did extend mercy unto him. But I guarantee you, if his attitude wasn't the way it was, if he wasn't humble, and if he wasn't acknowledging and confessing and forsaking his sin, he would have received the uttermost of the punishment from the Lord. It's not always, though, breaking God's laws that we're making excuses for. That is the most common thing. In my opinion, I think it's the most common thing is we sin and we want to justify it. You learn that from little kids. From, I mean, not from them, but when you're a little child growing up, you don't have to learn that very much to start pushing the blame off on anyone and anything else than yourself. Because people just don't want to admit when they're wrong. It's not always making excuses for things when we're breaking God's laws and doing things that he told us not to do. But sometimes it's for not doing what he does want us to do where we're making up excuses. Here we're going to see in Exodus chapter 4, God gets angry at Moses for the excuses that he keeps coming up with on why he can't do what God's telling him to do. God called Moses. God bade Moses, if you will, to a supper. Similar to that parable. God's calling on Moses to do a work for him, to do a job for him. Look at verse number one of Exodus chapter four. This is, this is at like the burning bush and God is explaining to him. Okay, in chapter three, you see that God's explaining to Moses how you're gonna go and you're gonna lead your people out of bondage. And he says, you know, like, who, well, who should, you know, how are they going to believe me? Who should I say sent me? And he tells them, you know, I am that I am. He gives them his name, all this stuff, right? All, that whole conversation is in chapter three. And now we're in chapter four and Moses is still kind of 
talking with God and just, you know, wrapping his whole mind around this and trying to figure out, like, what do you want me to do? And, um, and coming up with all the reasons he could come up with on how this plan's not going to work. You know, God, one of God's crazy schemes involving me. Oh, God, this is never going to work, God. You know why? And, and God keeps answering him and answering on why it's not going to work. And we're going to see God gets angry with Moses. He gets angry with him over this attitude. Look at verse number one. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. God just told them, I want you to go and speak to the children of Israel, and you're going to lead them out. And Moses has the audacity to speak unto God and say, Well, they're not going to believe me. Do what God told you to do. Whether they're going to believe you or not, this is, you know, you need to just listen and obey God. Now look, Moses is a great, one of the greatest men of God, I think, that's ever lived. And it's not taking away from Moses, but Moses wasn't perfect. He wasn't Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that. We see that with every single great man of God in the Bible. We see their downfalls. We see where they've lacked in faith or lacked in something and weren't perfect on purpose so that we don't elevate any one person above anyone else. And we could, just as much as we could learn from the great things that these men did and use them as examples, we could also learn from some of their shortcomings and their areas where they got, it, got angry at them so that we don't do the same thing. Moses answered and said, verse number one, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And at this point, God's still not angry, so he's answering his his questions, right? He's answering some of his, he's reproving him and telling him why, no, they will. Verse number two, and the Lord said unto him, what is that in thine hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it and it became a rod in his hand that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, put thine hand again into thy, into thy, put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. So God answers Moses with his objection. When he says, look, well, they're not going to believe me, God. He says, okay, what are you holding there, a staff? You guys, walking stick or whatever? He says, throw it on the ground. So when Moses throws it on the ground, it becomes a snake. Moses kind of jumps back and says, whoa. God says, pick it up by the table, by the tail. Pick it up by the tail. It's a staff again. So there's this miracle, this, this sign, this miraculous sign that Moses couldn't do except through the power of God. And then he's like, okay, here's another one for you. Put your hand into your bosom. So he's, you know, slips his hand inside his clothing or whatever. He's pull it back out. His hand's just like a leper, fully leprous, white, you know, diseased. And then he's like, put it back in there again. He puts it back, come back out. It's perfectly fine. They're like, they're like magic tricks, right? I mean, that's what, what it is. If you think about it today, it's, it's a magic trick, but it, they're real. It's not just an illusion. God made the rod become a snake. His hand was lit, really leprous as snow. And he's saying, oh, okay, you think they're not going to believe you, but when you start showing the power of God unto them, they will believe you. So Moses' objection, I mean, what else can you say to that? Okay, it sounds good to me. Good plan, God, Right? But look what he says. And he's saying, in verse 8, he said, you know, if they're not going to believe that first one, they'll believe the second one. Verse 9, it says, and it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. He's like, I'm going to even give you a third one. So if they don't listen to the first one, they're going to they're respect the second one. But if they re reject both of those, Take some water out of the river, just in their sight. Take some water, pour it on the ground, and it's going to become blood. That, that should be enough to settle whether or not God has sent you. But look at his response. I mean, think about that. Think about God 
telling you to do something and then just like, I mean, to me, that sounds pretty cool. <laughs> like, throw your staff on the ground and it becomes a snake and then you just pick it back up again. I mean, I, I don't know about you. I'd probably be like trying that like the whole, <laughs> the whole way back into town. Like, oh, sweet, <laughs> pick it up again. Uh, it just sounds like it would be so much fun. And think about God being able to use you in that way. How cool that would be. But that's not the attitude that Moses had. He starts to make excuses. His first excuse is, well, they're not going to believe me, God. Look at verse number 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. But I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. So now he's starting to change and saying, okay, well, maybe they'll believe me. But I'm not a really good speaker. I'm not a good public speaker. Now, I could really relate to this. Because I wasn't a good, I, don't, I mean, I don't know if I am now or not, but I, I definitely am way better than I was before. I could easily say, God, I realize that you're calling me to preach and to, and to, and to pastor a church and to, and to go out and preach God's going to do this stuff, but, you know, I'm not really eloquent. I, don't, I can't really speak very well. When God hears that, you know what that sounds like to him? An excuse. If God's telling you to do something, don't tell him why you can't do it. If you can't do it, he wouldn't be telling you to do it in the first place. It's actually insulting to the Lord for you to say, no, I can't do that. Amen. When he's already told you to do it. Verse 11, he answered him, and the Lord said unto him, who hath made man's mouth? Do you know who you're talking to? I created your mouth and your tongue. And you're going to tell me that you're not eloquent and you're of a slow speech? He says, or who maketh the dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Ain't I the one that makes this stuff? I'm the one that made your mouth. I'm the one that gave you the ability to speak or lack thereof. And I'm telling you to go speak unto the people. And you think you can't do it now? Verse number 12. Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. So he still explains to him even further. You just go, listen to me, and I'm going to give you exactly what you need to say. So you don't even have to worry about coming up with everything on your own. Just, just say what I tell you to say. And look at verse 13. I mean, you can't ask for anything more. God's going to tell you exactly what you need to say. He's told you to go. He's verified. Look, I made your mouth. You can do this. Go and do what I'm telling you to do. Stop telling me they're not going to believe you. Stop telling me you're not a good speaker. Just go and listen and do what I'm telling you to do. And you know what Moses' response was to all of that? Verse 13, he said, Oh, oh my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. Whom thou wilt, who you want to send? It's you, Moses. That's who God wants to send. It's not someone else. He's saying it to God as if it's, it's anyone else but him. Well, God, just send whoever you want to send. Verse 14. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. It got God angry because Moses kept coming up with excuses and coming up with excuses and giving all the reasons in the world why he couldn't do it. And when there was no more excuses left, he's just like, well, whoever you want to go, God. And having that uh, rotten attitude about doing the work of the Lord. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth. And I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth and will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people. And he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth. And thou shalt be to him instead of God. And thou shalt take this rod in thine hand wherewith thou shalt do signs. 
Flip back, if you would, to Luke 14. God's plan was to send Moses, and he still used him. He still was saying, look, I'm still going to talk to you. And just to prove that it's my words that I'm giving you to speak, that it doesn't matter how good of a speaker you are, I'm going to let Aaron do the speaking, but I'm going to tell you what to say, and you're going to tell him what to say. And I think through this, hopefully Moses saw, I could have said this. I could have done this if I would have just had a little bit of faith that God is going to allow me and, and use me to do whatever it is that he wants me to do. If I would just go out and do it and stop making excuses. God was sending Moses with a message to children of Israel and to Pharaoh. God is sending us today with a message. There is a work that we're all bidden to do. It's not just one work, but there is one main work that we are all being called to do. If you're not going sowing and preaching the gospel regularly, what is your excuse? How do you think God would react to your excuse? If he told you to go and preach the gospel to every creature and you responded with whatever your excuse is, whatever it is that's holding you back, imagine God standing there and saying, I want you to go and preach the gospel. And you respond with, Is God going to accept your response? Think about that. Because if he's, if he's not going to accept it, it's an excuse. If it's, Lord, I'm laying on my feet. I don't even have anyone to help drag me around to have a conversation with someone. If it's, you know, maybe God will accept that. Maybe. Maybe. But I'll tell you what, for almost every excuse I have ever heard as to why someone can't serve God, I have an example of someone in a worse condition serving God. Almost every single time I've heard anything from anybody. It's, it's a little angering to hear People say, oh, I can't come to church or I can't go soul winning because I've got a pain in my back. You don't understand. I got in an accident and I hurt my knee and I'm in pain. Oh, I, I've got what, whatever, right? Ailments and pains. And you start using that as an excuse. There are people that have ailments and pains every single day of their life and they don't complain about it and people barely even know that they have them because they're committed and they've heard the call of God and they're willing to just do it. Suck it up for a little while in this life and do what God's told you to do instead of coming up with every reason under the sun as to why you can't do something. We need to stop looking for every excuse in the world not to do what we're being told to do and just do it. I know as someone who's had people under me, again, uh, you know, as, uh, continuing on like this morning, I was using work or the workplace as examples. When I've got someone that has a job to do, you know what I don't want to hear? All the reasons why you can't do something. My boss doesn't want to hear all the reasons why we, when he wants to get something done, he wants to get that done. And if you're going to give him every excuse under sun as to why we can't do it, you know what he's going to do? He's going to find someone else to get done what he wants done. And God is the same way. He had a great work for Israel to do and be the lighthouse of the gospel of Jesus Christ under the whole world. But you know what? They came up with all kinds of excuses as to why they didn't want to accept it, why they didn't want to believe Jesus, why they didn't want to have anything to do with it. And you know what God did? God rejected them and said, fine, I'll use someone else. Fine, I'll find other servants to work in my vineyard and to bring forth the fruit thereof. And you know what? If you're hired to do that job and you're not going to do the work for him, Guess what's going to happen? He's going to find someone else to do the work, but woe unto you. 
I'm not saying you're going to lose your salvation and we can't lose our salvation, but woe unto you. You're back in Luke 14. Jesus is still looking for disciples today. Notice I said the word disciple. Disciple is different than a believer. A believer is someone who's saved because they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. A disciple is a follower of Jesus Christ. Not just someone who believes on him for their salvation, but someone who is willing to follow and work and do the things that Jesus has for you to do. That's a disciple. Someone who walks the walk. Does the work. Look at verse number 25. In Luke 14, the Bible says, And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. Notice, it doesn't say he can't be saved. It says he can't be my disciple. Because the truth of the matter is you don't have to hate your whole family in order to be saved. You just have to receive a free gift from God. Praise God for that, for the, for the simplicity and, and the, 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 the easy believism of just being able to receive a free gift. Putting your faith and trust on Jesus Christ to save you. Praise God for that free gift. But what are you going to do with that gift? What are you going to do with your eternal life? What are you going to do with the fact that God loved you enough to save your sinful soul? Are you going to show gratitude? You're going to respect God enough to listen to what he has to say. And if you're going to put God first, that's why he's saying you've got to hate your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brother, your sisters, and your own life also to be a disciple. Because in order to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you have to have him as number one. Verse 27. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. Does bearing a cross sound like something that's fun to do? <laughs> Think about this. Does coming to church three times a week sound like bearing a cross? Not even close. Does praying to God sound like bearing a cross? Are those things that we should be doing? Absolutely. Absolutely. But just because you're doing those things, does that mean you're a disciple of Jesus Christ? Nope. God's demanding more from us. It's not just this checklist of things that makes you a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's an attitude. It's what's in your heart. It's actually doing things and following through on, those, on that attitude and, those, and, and your belief in your heart. That's going to make you a disciple of Jesus Christ. And you have to be willing to bear your cross and your burden and actually do something unpleasant and just go out and work. And I don't care if I'm tired. I don't care if I look. Jesus Christ got whipped and beaten and scourged and mocked before he had to carry his own cross. But everyone wants it so easy today, and everyone wants to make up so excuses. You know, I can't, I can't bear my cross because I sprained my ankle. Yeah. Verse number 28 goes on to explain the cost, the cost involved with being a disciple of Jesus Christ. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he have sufficient to finish it. If I'm going to, you know, we're, we're talking about adding on to our house to try to get like another bedroom for our children or whatever. We're not going to start building and tearing down walls and starting to like build up stuff until I know we have enough money to do it. <laughs> right? I mean, it only makes sense. I'm not going to jump into something without knowing, hey, there's a cost involved here. How much is this actually going to be? Do I have enough to do it? If I don't have enough to do it, it's foolishness to get started on it. I'm never going to finish it. What's the point? That's what he's saying here about sitting down about this building a tower. Verse 29, lest happily after he hath laid the foundation is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him. And look, I would be the laughing stock when you're like, look at this guy. He's trying to build out. He can't even finish it. He just got this half done work out there that's good for nothing. Because now you've ruined what you already had and you didn't finish it. So it's, it's even in worse condition than when you started. 
Verse 30 saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Verse 31, or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000 or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciples. My disciple. You can't be worried and concerned about the things that you have when you go to serve God, when you go to serve Jesus, because he may be calling you and, and, and having you being bidden to work really hard for him. God likes workers. God wants people doing a lot of work for him. We need to be willing to, if you want to be his disciple, Think about that. If you want to be his disciple, not everyone is. Look, if being a disciple was easy, everyone would be doing it. If going soul winning was easy, everyone would be doing it. How hot was it today? It was like 100 degrees. I mean, I don't know. Oh, it's too hot. It's too hot to go knock on doors. Hmm. I could have had that attitude. Brother Robert could have had that attitude. Oh, yeah, it's, it's really uncomfortable. Oh, man, we were, we were sweating, weren't we? Wow, can you imagine that? Can you actually imagine sweating when you're going to work? What a concept. You know what? Before we left, we made sure we had water. Because we knew it was hot outside. Not fooling ourselves. Of course it's hot outside. We're going to make sure that we're hydrated. There's a cost involved. And look, that's a light thing. I'm not even saying that this was just some huge burden we had to bear today. I don't see it as such. I don't think it's that big of a deal. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people that do. That that alone, they come up with all the excuses in the world. I remember trying to go out sewing in Chicago and have people telling me, oh, it's raining. Oh, it's snowing. Oh, you know, I don't care. Let's go out and do the work that God's calling us to do. Let's stop making excuses like, oh, I might get a little bit wet. Oh, I might sweat a little bit. Well, good. It's called work. Let's be a laborer. Verse 34, salt is good, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath the ears to hear, let him hear God wants you to work. God doesn't want to hear your excuses. If salt doesn't have its flavor, its savor, if there's not, it's not good for anything. If you had a bunch of salt used for seasoning and there's no taste to it and it's not doing anything, is there any reason for it to cumber your table, to have it just sit on your table and never use it? It's good for nothing. What do you do? You're going to throw it away. If the job that God has for you, you're not doing it, we ought to have a godly fear and realize, you know what? God might just throw me away. And I'm not talking about going to hell. But just like the, 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 the fig tree or just like the, the tree's not producing fruit, look, God will work with you a little bit. He's going to try to prune those, those, those sinful branches off of you and get you to produce some fruit. But after a while, you're not producing any fruit. Well, what's their purpose then? If all you're going to do is just be an excuse tree, and that's all you produce is excuses, God's going to get sick of it after a while. He's not going to want to hear that anymore. There's a cost involved with being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Your salvation was free, but what are you going to do with that? Ephesians 2.10, of course, verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. Of course, we say that all the time out soul winning. Because salvation is free. It's a gift. It's easy. But if he follows that up with the freeness of salvation with verse number 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That's why we were created. We were created unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. If you are not doing good works, you are not a disciple of Jesus Christ at all. Not even close. Let's not have the attitude of, oh, this is too hard. 
or I don't know how you can expect me to do that. And instead have the attitude of, thank you, Lord, for committing such a great work to my trust. Please help me to have the right spirit and do a great work to your satisfaction. Yeah. Moses should have been honored that God chose him yeah. to do such a monumentous work. I mean, what, what a great honor and privilege to lead a whole nation of people out of bondage and to free him and to be used to stand up against Pharaoh. We need the right perspective on the work that we're called to do. Helping another soul to be saved from the fire is an important job. Yeah. And God gave that unto us to do. And if we don't do it, then nobody will. It's our job. And what an honor to be used in such a mighty way to have such influence and impact on people's lives. Thanks, God, for giving us that. Thank you for allowing us to be even considered to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Since he's not here on this earth physically walking around anymore, thank you for, for even considering us wicked sinners as people that can go to represent Jesus Christ. Do you have that attitude or do you have the attitude of, this sounds like a lot of work. I don't want to do that. I can't do that. I'm just a sinner. I mean, people are going to look at, uh, how can I represent Jesus Christ? How am I going to do that? I can't do that. And start to doubt and, and, and think, oh, I can't do anything for God. How could you have that attitude when God has already told you that's what he wants you to do? Don't let that attitude get you down. What do you think God's standards are for us individually? You think about it, you answer that question yourself in your mind. God's standards for you in this life. It's easy to get saved, but his standard for getting work done. What do you think is acceptable unto God? Turn if you would to Romans 12 while you're thinking about that. Is it, is it really just a matter of God wants you to attend church once a week, say a prayer, pay a tithe, go on with the rest of your life, the rest of your week, pleasing yourself. Is that God's standard? Do you think that's just as, well, if you're doing this, you're meeting my standard. Go to church, say a prayer, pay a tithe, done. Man, I'm, I've met God's standard for, for how much work he wants me to do. You think, well, God's a reasonable God, isn't he? He's understanding. He's merciful. He is. Absolutely he is. But you know what? Sometimes our idea of what's reasonable is not exactly the same as God's idea of what's reasonable. Oh, hey, we're in Romans 12, right? Look at that. God actually answers what's reasonable. He tells us what he expects of us and what, is, what his standard is. Thanks, God, for, for telling us this because without this, we would literally be lost. We would think that we are so great and righteous just by doing a few simple things. Look at verse number, 12, verse number 1 of Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So what does God consider reasonable? Your entire body being a living sacrifice unto God. Pretty far off from what I was thinking is reasonable. Not really. Why is that so reasonable? Jesus Christ bought and paid for your soul. To not have to face the punishment you rightfully deserve. It's only reasonable that you live your life for the one who saved you, who saved your soul from destruction, as opposed to not caring about it. Ultimately, you could say you care about it, 
But when you're not doing anything for them, it just turns into words. Empty words. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Don't think too highly of yourself, is what he's saying. We need to be humble and remember, look, our reasonable service is offer up ourselves a living sacrifice. Don't ever get too comfortable with, I'm sure I'm doing just fine in God's eyes. And, and we need to be striving to do more all the time. Welcome to Word of Truth Baptist Church. It's time to stop giving the reasons why you can't get something done and start figuring out how you will get something done. The mindset that always comes up with an excuse is never going to get anything done. You're just going to be jumping from excuse to excuse. It starts with the shift in your heart and in your mind. I thank God for the, the great examples that we have in the Bible demonstrating what people are capable of. Look at all of the works and all the great wondrous things that people have done for God in the service of God and how they've spent their times and dedicated their lives unto doing things to just promote the glory of God's name and bring salvation to people. And I mean, we look at someone like the Apostle Paul. And all the work that he did and the work that he put in and the, 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 the multitudes of people that he reached. You could have one of two mindsets. You could come up with all the excuses as to why you can't be an Apostle Paul. All the excuses. All the re reasons, right? Why can't you reach a lot of people? Oh, well, you see, I've got this debt and... You know, I've got to work, I've got to do this other stuff, and I can't really serve God because, you know, there's all, these other, there's all this stuff going on in my life, and my life's a wreck. You can have that attitude, and you know what's going to happen? You're not going to do anything for God. You can continue with that attitude, you're going to get nothing done. And you know what? That attitude, you don't, you're not a disciple of Jesus Christ at all. Because you care about the things of this world a little bit too much. But if you have an attitude of saying, you know what? Apostle Paul, was, he was a great man. And he did a lot for God. But you know what? He was a man. He was not Superman. He didn't have supernatural powers of like, well, he never has to sleep. He never has to eat. He can just serve God all day long and just, and, and just this, this, this force that he never has to do anything like normal people do. He didn't have that. And if he did, God gave it to him. And if it was available to him, it's available to anyone else. But, it, I mean, that's not, that's not what happened. He was a man who decided that he was thankful. He, he was a man who God called. He didn't reject the call and give God all of the reasons why he couldn't do something. I mean, think about it. He had all the reasons in the world after persecuting the church to give God an excuse as to why he couldn't go and preach the gospel now. No one's going to believe me, Lord. I've been persecuting the church. No one's going to accept me. He didn't have that attitude. He went off and did. Okay, where do you want me to go? I'm going to use you to be a light to Gentiles. All right. And something that he could have used as an excuse to say, well, no one's going to believe me because I persecuted the church actually gave him even more power because he could say, hey, I used to persecute the church. I'm a believer now. You can look at it either way. How is your mindset? How is your attitude? What, do you th what, what is it that's driving you? Do you have the attitude that says, here I am, Lord, send me. I'm willing to do your work. Like Elisha. 
Elijah says, what do you want? What can I give you? I mean, you, you've, you've been working this hard. You've stayed with me this whole time. What can I do for you? I want a double portion. Elijah, do you know how much I've done? All the work I've done? Yeah, I want a double portion. Praise God. We need more Elijah's, that attitude. Not one that makes up excuses. Like all the sons of the prophets, don't you know that your master's going to be taken away from you today? Don't you know that? Yeah, I know it. Shut up. I want to do something even more for God than what he did. Elijah was, a, was a, a man with like passions like as we. We need to figure out how we're going to get something done. Look at the great examples that are out there today and in the Bible and, and figure out and say, you know what? There is no reason why we can't do the same thing or more. Psalm 78 explains that we're limiting what God can do when we have a poor attitude. And I'll just read it for you. Psalm 78, verse number 40, the Bible reads, How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness? Get talking about the children of Israel in the wilderness. And grieve him in the desert. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them out, delivered them from the enemy. See, their lack of faith and trusting in God and just willingness to go and do the work is limiting God. Just like Jesus Christ was limited when he was among those of his own people, the people he grew up around, because they didn't believe him. So he couldn't do very many mighty works in his own homeland. They limited what Jesus can do through their unbelief. Our poor attitude to do the work is going to limit what God can do in this community. I don't know about you, but I want to do way more than we're doing right now. I'm actually getting kind of, you know, praise God for the souls that were saved. But I don't want to be in a rut. I want to do more to serve the Lord and have that attitude of I know that we can do more. I know that we can reach more people. And if anyone's limiting God in this area, it's us. There is a lot more work to be done here. Thank you and God bless you for all the work that everyone's done here. This isn't just a slam on the people sitting in the room tonight or anyone else for that matter. It's a, 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 an admonishment to let's do more. Let's work. Let's, let's not just get too relaxed and too easy about all the work that needs to be done and just come up with every excuse under the sun as to why we can't work harder. We've had many challenges this year. I started up something new this year with all the different challenges that we're doing. And there's going to be more. I'm not stopping with the challenges. But are you going to be making excuses as to why you can't do the next challenge? Challenge to work harder? To do, and it's, it's nothing new. I'm not, none of our challenges have been some new commandment that's not found in the Bible that, oh, Pastor Burson is just challenging us to do something that, you know, like... To, to build an addition onto his house, right? It's not one of the challenges is just do something for my benefit. The challenges are literally coming from God's word. And I think I've demonstrated and proven how they're completely biblical and not even, not even going really beyond what could be our reasonable service unto God. I think it's far from being some slave driver to where you can't even do anything else with the rest of your life trying to fulfill one of these challenges. You know how I know that? Because I completed every single one of those challenges. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna ask anyone else to do what I won't do myself, ever. If I'm not willing to do it, I won't ask you to do it. But it's a matter of excuses. Are you gonna come up with excuses or how much do you care? How much of a reasonable service are you willing to give unto the Lord? Oh, but you're the pastor. I'm just a, I'm a man. I am the pastor, but I'm, but I work a full-time job. I have a family. I'm not dipping into extra time that I have because I'm a full-time pastor and that's all I do. Let's lose the excuse mentality. Our life is short. It's like a vapor. 
it's going to be gone before you know it. And I know, I know, I know, I know, I say the same thing. Everyone says the same thing. And the older that you get, the more you realize how fast time really goes. Those of you that are younger, pay attention because you think you have all the time in the world. And as you start to get a little bit older, you realize the hours turn into days, days turn into weeks, weeks turn into months, months turn into years, and it meant years turn into decades, and before you know it, uh, I'm communicating with someone last night who was born the year I graduated high school. <laughs> and that was really weird. How did that happen? It happens fast. Fast. Let's not waste this time. Yeah, you know what? It's going to be a little difficult. It's going to be hard. You might sweat. You might have to bear a cross. But it's nothing compared to eternity. Keep the right focus in mind. Let's have an attitude that is not just looking for every excuse, but looking to do every way how we can do what God wants us to do. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the great examples we have in your word, dear Lord. I pray that you would please work in our hearts and our minds, dear Lord. And, and God, I, I think we have a great church, Lord. And it's, this is not a sign of our church at all. You know the hearts and minds of our, of our church here, dear God. And we just ask that you would be able to use us even more, Lord. We, we're willing, and, um, and, and I believe that, that we're not going to, no one here is going to want to make up excuses to not do uh, the work that you have for us, dear God. I know that I'm not. I want you to show us, help us, lead us, help us to, um, to, to understand the, the changes that we need to make in order to accomplish the great works that you have for us to do, dear God. I'm willing to offer up myself as a living sacrifice unto you, dear Lord, and, and um, it is totally reasonable for you to ask us to give our lives for you since you've already given your life for us, dear God. And I pray that you would please just help continue our church to grow and to, and to really do, really do a great work. We, we're here, dear Lord. We're, send, send me, send us, dear God. We're here to do your will. And um, please teach us and guide us and, and strengthen us, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.